All right, so we're going to do today uh, section 4.5, which is, again, one of my favorite subjects in the course, uh, talking about optimization problems. Uh, we headed off this chapter by talking about why it's important to find uh, maximum or minimum values of a function. And then we went off into a general abstract method for doing that. Uh, but we're also interested, for practical reasons, finding maximum and minimum values of functions. And that's what this section is about, applying those max-min techniques to real-world problems. Okay. So is this going to stay slow? I hope not. Or are you just going to stare at the front screen here? So why is there a picture of snow here? Well, because we've been having such winter-like weather. Also, if you look at the chain here, uh, it droops in a certain curve. And this link of the ch this loop of chain droops the same as this, the same as this, the same as this. And it turns out that the shape of this curve actually optimizes a certain quantity, the amount of potential energy that's in all the links of those chains. Okay? That it looks kind of like a parabola. It's not actually a parabola. It's called a catenary. Uh, but you can write down a formula for the amount of potential energy in the curve and then uh, optimize it. I'll start with a basic example. And from that example, we'll extract a framework That'll work in general. Okay, so the basic problem here is what is the rectangle of fixed perimeter with maximum area? Now you might already have a guess as to what the answer to this question is going to be, but let's work it out using a calculus problem to see how we can derive the correct answer. Okay, so let's all remember what a rectangle looks like. Here's a nice little golden rectangle. Uh, it's got a length and it's got a width. Length and a width. Okay, and how do you find the area of a rectangle in terms of its length and width? Well, we all know that you multiply the length and the width together. And that is the thing that we want to make the largest. We want to make the area as large as possible. But the problem is that the area is a function of both the length and the width. Okay, and that's two variables. If you look at all the possible rectangles, they have varying lengths and varying widths. So we're only in a single variable calculus class. How do you maximize a function of two variables? Uh, by the same token, if we could vary each of the variables independently, then we could make our rectangle infinitely wide and infinitely long, and then we would have an infinitely large rectangle. But that's obviously not the point of the problem. What we're given is a constraint that the perimeter of this rectangle is fixed. Okay, so the idea is not to make the biggest possible rectangle, but the biggest possible rectangle with a single piece of string. Right? So that fact that the perimeter is fixed allows me to relate the length and the width into a single equation. The perimeter is 2 times the length plus 2 times the width. So I can solve for the length in terms of the width. It's perimeter minus 2 times the width divided by 2. And so I can plug that into the area equation. And I've got uh, length times width, or p perimeter minus twice the width divided by 2 times the width, which I can write now as 1 half p times w, perimeter times width, minus the width squared. Okay, Now this looks like uh, still a function of two variables because we have two letters, p and w. But perimeter, p, is fixed. So p is a constant, w is the only variable. Which is good news for us because we're in a single variable calculus class. Hopefully we can find the maximum value of this function. Okay, So a is just a function of w. What is the domain of this function? Well, if you just look at the expression, 1 half pw minus w squared, then that's something that you can evaluate for any number w. But we're applying this to an actual geometric problem. The width is going to be something which is non-negative. We don't have rectangles with negative width. So the domain would have to be non-negative numbers. And also, we want the area to be a non-negative number. So the area, the width can't get too big. The natural domain would be the closed interval, 0 to p over 2. Okay, if the width is bigger than half of the perimeter, think about a rectangle where the width is half the perimeter. Well, then the top of the rectangle would have the same half of perimeter width, and you wouldn't have any leftover length to make up the length of the rectangle. So that's as big as it can get, or as wide as it can get. After that, the area becomes negative. So now the goal is to find the maximum value of the function a of w, 1 half p times w minus w squared, on the closed interval 0 to p over 2. 
if you're uh, nervous about all the, the letters going on here, that's fine. Just replace this P with some number like 100. And then it really is a function of a single lettered variable. OK, let's remember what the closed interval method says. Well, you have to, uh, if you want to find extreme values of a function on a closed and bounded interval, then you need to evaluate that function at the endpoints of the interval and also at any critical points of the interval. So endpoints are easy. We just have to plug in a of 0. That would be 0. And a of p over 2 is also 0, which you can check just by plugging it in here. 1 half times p times p over 2. That would be p squared over 4. And then if w is p over 2, w squared is p squared over 4 as well. They subtract get 0. Okay. Uh, the critical points would be the solutions to the derivative being equal to 0. The derivative, dA dw, is 1 half times p minus 2 times w. Right? Just use the power rule here. Uh, 1 half p times w is a constant times w, so the derivative is just that constant. OK, well, when is 1 half p minus 2 times w equal to 0? w is the variable. We want to solve that equation for w. And what you get is that w is p over 4. 1 half p minus 2 times w, oops, that should be an equal sign, equals 0, or w equals p over 2 divided by 2, making 4. OK. So that's our one critical point. And as long as, sorry, I just want to make a note to fix this. typo here. OK, so what? This is the only critical point. It must be the maximum uh, point of the function, because we already determined that the function was 0 at the endpoints. So as long as we have something positive here, it's got to be the maximum. And what is that value? Well, when you plug in a of p over 4, it's, um, well, the length becomes p over 4 as well. And the area is the length times the width. So length is p over 4. The width is p over 4. What kind of rectangle is this? It's a square. Its length and width are the same. And the maximal area, the maximum value of the area function is p over 4 times p over 4. We get p squared over 16. And we're done. So we've shown that if the perimeter of a rectangle is fixed, the largest the area can be is the area of a square using that same perimeter. Okay. Now, like I said, you could probably make some kind of symmetry argument that it would have to be a square. Because if you've got a rectangle and you flip it around, and you've got another rectangle, so if one of them is maximal, the other one would have to be maximal. But this is a nice calculus method for maximizing the area of the rectangle subject to a fixed perimeter. OK. Yes? Um, how do we know it's a square? Exactly? How do we know it's a square? Its length and its width are the same. That's what a square is, right? A rectangle where all four sides are the same. All right? uh, whatever p is p over 4 and p over 4 are the same. OK. So what is the framework that we used for solving this optimization problem? How can we abstract that and use it for other problems? Well, it's basically a four-step problem. OK. The step one is to understand the problem. Sounds ridiculous, right? But actually, it takes some time to understand what the problem actually is about. Uh, next is to devise the plan. In this case, the plan is really going to be um, finding the maximum or the minimum value of a function. Carry out the plan. This is just uh, doing the actual calculus behind the maximization or minimization problem. And then review and extend. In problems, complicated problems like these, it often helps you understand the problem better once you've solved it by looking at the steps that uh, got you there. For instance, when we were here, you know, we, we derived that the rectangle of maximal area was a square, and then we cogitated about that for a little bit and said, OK, yeah, that actually does make some sense. OK, and this uh, four-step strategy for problem solving was articulated very well by George Polya. He was a Polish, actually, sorry, Hungarian mathematician. I should know, because I'm a quarter Hungarian. Uh, he came to the United States, and he did a lot of teacher training, and he wrote a book of, called How to Solve It, which is about problem solving, but also about how to teach students to solve problems. And so he carried out this method here. And if you think that I made this up, I have, let's see, 
I have a diagram. Where's my diagram? Here it is. Okay. I have a diagram from uh, one of my daughter's worksheets in school in which they use the very same methods as in Polya's method for solving problems. So first we'll see them in calculus, and then we'll see them in kindergarten. Okay. So step one is understand the problem. What is known? What is unknown? What are the conditions? You know, you read that paragraph, and I think this is what students find so daunting about story problems, is that they look at it and say, what is going on here? That is the first step, is understanding the problem articulating what is known, what is unknown, and what the conditions are. What exactly are we supposed to find here? That's an important step in understanding. Drawing a diagram, not optional, especially if you're optimizing some geometric thing. Obviously, you want to draw a picture of that thing that you're optimizing. Another famous problem solver, his name is Terence Tao. Uh, he's won the Fields Medal, which is given to the outstanding mathematician under age 35. I think he won it when he was like 25. A uh, famous problem solver and mathematician at Berkeley has a great math blog, if you're into math blogs. And he wrote a book on problem solving, and he said that the diagram is an important step in solving the problem because if nothing else, it gives you something to look at while you're thinking about what to do next. Okay, so draw the picture and then stare at it while you're scratching your head. Okay, introduce notation. You want to make variables for the things which are actually varying. So with our rectangle, we made a variable for the length and a variable for the width. We also made a constant named p for the perimeter. All right? Now, a lot of times, people don't like to have ex extra letters floating around. They would rather just say, if the perimeter is 100, I'll write 100. But for me, using um, notation and using named constants instead of you know, numerical constants allows me to uh, clean it up and to use algebra in place of arithmetic. I'm much better at algebra than I am at arithmetic. So. I will use letters for constants. Okay. Expressing the objective function, this is a, an economics term. Anytime we're, we're doing some optimization problem, we're optimizing something, and that thing that we're optimizing is called the objective. And who knows what it's called, but maybe we'll use the letter Q for it. I don't know. You want to express that objective in terms of the other things that you've named, the things which are varying and the things which are constant. If you can't, then you need to go back and you know, figure out exactly what is changing. Okay. If that objective is a function of more than one of the variables that you have, such as our area was a function of the two variables, length and width, then you have to work a little bit harder to get it down to a single variable. Okay. And most of the time, in the problems that we're posing, there will be some constraint which relates the two variables which are changing. Well, relates all the variables which are changing in such a way that you can get it down to one. So we used the fact that the perimeter was fixed to write the length in terms of the width, so we could write the area of the rectangle totally in terms of the width. Okay, and then step six, this is, this is where the calculus part comes in. Find the absolute maximum or minimum values depending on the problem of the function on its domain. Okay. And for that, we know how to do that. Right? Find the critical points, look at endpoints. We have several methods for finding global maxima and minima and the values. Okay, so back to this picture. What do we say? Understand the problem, draw a diagram, introduce notation. What does it say on my daughter's worksheet here? Problem solving strategy, draw a picture, understand, plan, solve, and check. So you see polio is uh, all over the place throughout the American educational system. Now, about optimization, the actual calculus part, let's remember the methods that we have for doing these things. For in section 4.1, we learned about the closed interval method. If you have uh, a function defined on a closed and bounded interval, A to B, we need to check the following points, the endpoints, A and B, and the critical points. The critical points are the place where the derivative is 0 or there is no derivative at all. It's not differentiable at x. Then you just plug all those points into the function, and you find the largest of the values, and that's the maximum value. And the smallest or the most negative, that, that's the minimum value. OK, what else? What other ways do we have to find extreme values? Well, we also learned the first derivative test. This was from section 4.3. So if you have a critical point, and you look on either side of the critical point, you'll, you can t decide or determine whether it's increasing or decreasing before or after that point. If the derivative changes from negative to positive as it crosses over C, so it's negative to the left of C and positive to the right of C, 
then it's decreasing before, increasing after. That's a local minimum. If it changes from positive to negative, then the function changes from increasing to decreasing. And so you have a local maximum there. If it doesn't change sign, like it goes negative and then negative after, or positive and positive after, then sees not any kind of local extremum. What that means is that, well, a lot of times we'll have functions where the derivative is negative for all x less than the, the critical point, and the derivative is positive for all x greater than the critical point. So there's a single critical point, and everything to the left has a negative derivative, everything to the right has a positive derivative. What that means is that towards the left we have decreasing, and from the right we have increasing. So we have a single critical point, and then that makes it not only the local minimum, but the global minimum. Respectively, if you have uh, a negative, do I? No, I switched these. That's good. Yeah. If the derivative is negative when x is greater than c, and the derivative is positive when x is less than c, we're in the opposite situation. It's increasing before the critical point, decreasing after the critical point. And so we have not just a local maximum, but a global maximum. Okay. So if we have a single critical point, and we can tell that the derivative changes its sign on either side of that critical point, then we found not just a local extremum, but the global extremum. So what other tools at our disposal do we have to find the local extreme values of a function? We also have the second derivative test. If you don't remember everything about the second derivative test, you can reread section 4.3. The second derivative test requires us to have a function which is continuous, and a first derivative which is continuous, and a second derivative which is continuous, all on a closed interval a to b. If we have a point c in the interior of that interval, in the open interval a to b, where the first derivative is equal to 0, then that's what we call a critical point. If we take that critical point and look at the second derivative of the function at that critical point, and that second derivative is negative, what we know is that f of c is a local maximum. If, on the other hand, at that critical point, the second derivative is positive, then we know that the f function's value, f of c, is a local minimum. If the function second derivative is 0, then the second derivative test doesn't actually tell us anything. We have to go into further derivatives. Really, the second derivative test is going to be inconclusive and unproductive at this point. Luckily for us, most of the examples that we will look at will not have this uh, pathology where the second derivative is 0 at the critical point. Okay, If we combine this with what we know about uh, functions which are always differentiable, then we have a nice little cor corollary, which is that if we find a critical point f prime, uh, if we find a critical point c, where the first derivative is 0, and we know that the second derivative is always positive, no matter what x is, then this point c has to be the global or absolute minimum value of the function. On the other hand, if f prime of c is 0 and the second derivative is always negative, then po the point c is the global or absolute maximum of the function. Okay, So if we only find one critical point, and we know that the second derivative is always positive or always negative, then we know that that one critical point is the absolute extreme point, which is very convenient. Now, which of these tests should you use and when? We have many choices. Which is the best choice in which situations? Well, what I like about the closed interval method is that there isn't any need for inequalities. We take the critical points, we evaluate the function at the critical points, we evaluate the function at the endpoints of the closed interval, and then we just find the largest and the smallest or the most negative, and those are extreme values. We automatically get the global extrema just by looking at the finite set of values which comes by evaluating at the critical points. Unfortunately, we can't use the closed interval method all the time. It only works when we have a closed bounded interval on the domain. What we saw is that if the uh, domain is not closed or not bounded, then there can fail to be extreme points, and we won't be able to find them using the closed interval method. So when is it good to use the first derivative test? What I like about the first derivative test is that in contrast to the closed interval method, it works if the domain is not a closed interval 
or is not a bounded interval if it goes for all positive numbers, for instance. And the other advantage to it is that you only have to take one derivative of the function. You don't have to do a whole lot of heavy-duty calculation. Unfortunately, for some, making comparisons with the first derivative test involves some use of inequalities. You have to look at what happens near critical points, and that involves a discussion of whether, when it's going to be positive, when it's going to be negative. And there's a little bit work to, more work to do at the boundary than with the closed interval method, especially if you have multiple critical points. Second derivative test, I like it because it works on non-closed and non-bounded intervals, uh, much like the first derivative test. And in contrast to the first derivative test, I don't need to do any inequality arguments. I simply have to plug it in to the second derivative. But of course, I will need to take a second derivative. And in many situations, uh, taking one derivative is enough work. I may not want to take a second derivative. Think about a quotient of two functions. When you take the derivative of a quotient, you get a much more complicated quotient. And then taking the second derivative would involve a derivative of that complicated quotient. So that might be a situation where you would want to avoid the second derivative test. And the other thing which is not so nice about the second derivative test is that it's less conclusive. Uh, we are some points for which we can use the first derivative test that we cannot use the second derivative test. For instance, if the function is not always differentiable, we're not able to use the second derivative test. So which to use and when? My summary advice is to use the closed interval method whenever you can. If the domain is a closed and bounded interval, use the closed interval method. If the domain is not closed or not bounded, then you have to decide, and this might be a case-by-case -case basis, would you rather do a sign chart making an inequality argument, or would you rather use the second derivative test? And if the function that you are trying to find the extreme values for is simple enough that the second derivative test is, is easy to compute, then I would say use the second derivative test. Otherwise, use the first derivative test. OK, so that's my advice for finding extreme values of functions. Let's take a look at a few more examples and apply Polya's method as well as the optimization techniques that we've been discussing already. So talk again about a fence. Uh, in this case, we have a rectangular plot of farmland bounded on one side by a river, and on the other three sides by a single strand electric fence. Uh, we have 800 meters of wire at our disposal. What is the largest area that you can enclose, and what are its dimensions? So let us think back to the plan for solving problems. Step one was to understand the problem. Does everybody understand the problem? Well, that amounts to more than just reading along and, and nodding. What, to understand the problem, we have to parse out from the, the, the paragraph here what things are known, what things are unknown, what things are changing, and what things are constant. So what we know is that we have 800 meters of wire to use, uh, but what we don't know is how much area we'll be able to enclose with this 800 meters of wi wire. Our objective, the thing that we want to find the extreme value for, is the area that we are enclosing. And the constraint, what we can't change, is the amount of fence that we have. Well, I suppose we could use less than 800 meters of wire, and so we do have some control of, of that. But if you think about it for a little bit, you'll realize that the biggest fence is definitely going to use all of the wire. All right, so we know how much fence we're going to use. It's 800 meters. We don't know how much area we're going to enclose. We want to find the maximum value of the area that we enclose subject to a fixed amount of fence. So that was step one. Now we understand the problem. Step two is to draw a diagram. So here's my diagram. I have a river with a fish, and I have a plot of farmland with a cow. And as you can see, I've got a fence around that plot of farmland. Now, the picture is great, but how are we going to translate this into math? Let us uh, assign some notation to the changing quantities in this picture that is the length and width of the rectangle that forms the plot of farmland. So here I've got them labeled. The length of the plot will be L, and the width of the plot will be W. These are the variables that are changing depending on what kind of 
plot uh, what kind of rectangle I use to enclose with the fence. So the next step is to take these variables and use them to express the quantities which are changing and are fixed in our particular problem. What is it that we wanted to find the extreme value for again? We wanted to maximize the area of this rectangular plot. So the area is the product of the length and the width. And without any relationship between length and width, we wouldn't be able to maximize the area. We would just take the largest possible length and width. But length and width are related by the fact that the amount of fence we have is fixed. And so the amount of fence that we would use if we were to draw or enclose a plot of farmland like this would be, well, we can see two widths and one length. So the amount of fence we use is L plus 2 times W. And that's where the fact that this plot of farmland is against a river comes into the problem. If we just had a plot of farmland in the middle of a field, then the fence would have to go all the way around. It would form a rectangle, and would be, we would be back in the situation with the previous problem. The optimal fence would enclose a square. But in this case, the river changes it a bit. So how do we use the constraint to reduce the number of variables in the problem? So I'm going to call p uh, the amount of fence that I use, and it's length plus 2 width. And that's going to be fixed to be a constant 800. So the objective, the area, which I've called q, can be written now entirely in terms of the width, w. I can write it as p minus 2 times w times w. p is a constant, remember. It's not a variable anymore. So the objective function q simplifies to p times w minus 2 w squared. OK, so this nice polynomial, definitely going to be continuous. What is the domain that we are most concerned about? Polynomials is a do defined for all real numbers, but in terms of modeling our problem, we are most interested in the interval 0 to p over 2. Now, where did that come from? Well, we're only interested in w's which make q a positive number, because we want a positive width and a positive length. Multiply them together, we'll get a positive area. And to make sure that p times w minus 2w squared is going to be positive, both w will have to be positive and the other factors p minus 2 times w. So the domain of this function is a closed interval, 0 to p over 2, which means we can use the closed interval method to find the maximum value. So what will we have to do? We have to find the critical points and compare it to the values of the function at the endpoints. Well, we can actually plug in the values at the endpoints quite easily. Area is length times width. When the width is 0, the area is 0. When the width is p over 2, that's the same thing as saying that the length is 0. And so the area will be again 0. The value of this function at the two endpoints is 0. So as long as we have a positive value at any critical point, that will definitely be the maximum value. How do we find the critical points? We take the derivative of the function. q of w is p times w minus 2w squared. p being a constant, the derivative of p times w is p. Then the derivative of 2w squared is 4w. So the derivative is p minus 4 times w. For which values of w is that going to be 0? Solve the equation p minus 4w equals 0. And you get that w is p over 4. All right, so that's a critical point. w is p over 4. And as long as the area is positive when the width is p over 4, that will be our maximum value. Now, what is the length when the width is p over 4? We can go back to this equation here. p minus 2 times p over 4. The length becomes p over 2. And so the product of those is going to be uh, p over 4 times p over 2. That is p squared over 8. And that's definitely a positive number. So that's the absolute maximum value of the area function. And finally, we can actually plug in what p was in terms of our problem. If p is 800, then we square it and divide by 8. And we get 80,000 square meters. And if you look back at the picture that I've drawn here, uh, the area is maximized when the length is twice the width. So the dimensions that I've drawn in my sample picture are, in fact, the optimal dimensions.
once you've found the ex maximum value of the, f of the function, it is often good practice to go back to the problem and make sure that you have answered all of the questions. And if we go back to this, the paragraph in this problem, we'll notice that it was asked to find the dimensions of the optimal rectangle. 80,000 square meters is the area of the optimal rectangle. The dimensions are the length and the width of that optimal rectangle. So if P is 800, the width is P over 4, which is 200 meters, and uh, the length is P over 2, which is 400 meters. OK, so we have seen a couple of examples worked out. Uh, let's look at this next example. And we'll read it now. They, we would like to find a shortest fence. A 216 square meter rectangular pea patch is to be enclosed by a fence and divided into two equal parts by another fence parallel to one of its sides. What dimensions for the outer rectangle would require the smallest total length of fence? And then secondly, how much fence will be needed? All right, so you've seen me work some of these out by myself. I'd like you to try this one by yourself and then come back and we'll look at the solution. OK, well, let's look at how we would solve a problem like this. Step one, as usual, is to understand the problem. And as we read this problem, we think about what is it that's known what is, it that un what is it that's unknown? Since we know that this is an optimization problem, we need to be on the lookout for things which indicate optimization. And we also need to look out for the things which are indicating constraints. So as we read the paragraph, there's one word which tells us that this is an optimization problem. And that word is smallest. Smallest means the smallest length. And that's an extreme value. Length of what? length of fence. So what we need to do is create a function which measures the length of fence used and find the absolute minimum of that function. OK. Let's take a look at a drawing of the pea patch. Here we have a rectangular pea patch. I've, given the name, I've named its length L and its width W. And my pea patch has a fence that goes down the middle, just like the one in the problem. As you can see, I've got some nice big peas here, too. The length of fence which is used is made up of the top and the bottom here, the left and the right sides, and also this one in the middle here. And if you count, you have two lengths and three widths that are needed in terms of fence. So the function that I'm trying to find the minimum value for is two times the length plus three times the width. Now, when I see students work out this problem, I notice that they want to call this P as if it were the perimeter of the rectangle. That's not actually true. The perimeter is 2 times the length plus 2 times the width. In this case, we're trying to find the minimum value of something else, which is uh, the perimeter plus one side. <coughs> now, the relationship between the length and width is governed by the constraint. And in this case, it's the area that's constrained. We're told that the area is going to be a constant, which is 216. So in contrast to the previous problems, in those cases we had some fixed amount of, of length, and we wanted to maximize area. In this case, we have fixed area, and we want to minimize length. So to do that, we need to write that uh, fence function in terms of a single variable. Here we have it in terms of the length and the width. To write it only in terms of the width, we can solve the constraint equation for the length in terms of the width. L is equal to 216 divided by W. So F can be written as 2 times 216 divided by W plus 3 times W. So I've left the uh, area as a constant A just to keep the arithmetic a little cleaner. We'd like to find the minimum value now of the function f of w, which is defined to be 2a divided by w plus 3w. And the domain of this function is all positive numbers. That's another difference between this example and the previous example. In the previous examples, we had a closed interval being the domain. In this case, we can't assume that the domain is a closed interval. No matter what w is, whether w is 
some small positive number or some really, really large positive number, I will be able to create a p-patch which has the right area and has width w. I'll just have a really long or a really small length. So we need to find the minimum value of this function on an interval which is neither closed nor bounded. So closed interval method is out the window, but maybe we can try one of our other tests. The derivative, which we will need to find any critical points, is negative 2a divided by w squared plus 3. Now, where did that come from? Rather than use the quotient rule on 2a divided by w, I thought of it instead as 2 times a times w to the minus 1. And then I used the power rule to find its derivative. The derivative would be negative 2 times a times w to the minus 2, which I wrote then as a fraction, negative 2a divided by w squared. The derivative of 3w is just 3. And so the derivative of f is negative 2a over w squared plus 3. When is that equal to 0? Well, that's a simple equation. You solve that equation for w, and you get that the, the critical point is when w is the square root of 2 times a divided by 3. Now, only one critical point, which is nice. Does that critical point represent a maximum or a minimum? We can find that by looking at the second derivative. Because this first derivative is just a power expression, negative 2 times a times w to the minus 2, I went ahead and decided I would take the second derivative and use the second derivative test. The second derivative will be negative 2 times negative 2, or 4, times a times w to the minus 3. Now the exponent is negative, but if you have a positive number to a negative exponent, you will still get a positive number. So the second derivative is always going to be positive, which is great because we have a single critical point and a second derivative which is always positive, and that tells us that our one critical point is the absolute minimum for this function. So the optimal width is the square root of 2 times a divided by 3. And if we plug in what the length is supposed to be, it's the area divided by the width, what we get is that's the square root of 3 times a divided by 2. For our particular value of a, a is 216, we will find that the width is 12 and the length is 18. And so there we have it. The shortest fence can be built when the width is 12 meters and the length is 18 meters. The amount of fence we will need then is 2 times the square root of 3a root of three over 2 plus 3 times the square root of 2a over 3, and that simplifies to 2 times the square root of 6a, which in our case is 72 meters. OK, so there was a little bit more algebra because of all the square roots there. But we still followed the same process. We identified the function that we wanted to find the extreme value for, and then we used uh, one of our derivative tests to find the extreme values of that function. One more example, and let's read this one through. An advertisement consists of a rectangular printed region plus 1 inch margins on the sides and 1.5 inch margins on the top and bottom. If the total area of the advertisement is to be 120 square inches, what dimensions should the advertisement be to maximize the area of the printed region? So step one, understand the problem, right? We have a rectangular piece of paper with a rectangular printed region inside of it. And we have prescriptions on how big the margins are going to be. And we are told that the area of the piece of paper is to be 120 square inches. The question, the thing that we don't know, is how we should decide the dimensions to maximize the area of the printed region. So the last few words here are telling us the objective. Maximize the area of the printed region. So we had better write down the function which computes the area of the printed region to find its maximum. The constraints in this problem are, well, first of all, that we have fixed margins. And they are going to help us find the relationships between the dimensions of the printed region and the dimensions of the paper. And also that the total area of the paper is fixed at 120 square inches. Now this is the answer. If you've already solved the problem and you can just check it, you'll know that you're right. But how do we actually solve this? Well, let's take a look. I've drawn a sample advertisement. And I've marked off the rectangular printed region and the margins. And I've decided to let x and y 
be the width and height of the printed region. If I do that, then I know that the width and height of the paper are x plus 2, one on the left and one on the right, and y plus 3, one and a half on the top and one on the bottom. The reason I decided, and it was only a personal choice, to make the x and y be the dimensions of the printed region and not of the paper is that if I had let x and y be the dimensions of the paper, I would have had to subtract the margins, and I would just rather add than subtract. Kind of an arbitrary choice, but it did simplify my life a little bit. So what we want to maximize is the area of the printed region, which is just the product of x and y, subject to the constraint that the area is fixed at 120. The area, that is, of the paper, which is computed by taking x plus 2 times y plus 3. So maximize x times y subject to x plus 2 times x y plus 3 is 120. That constraint equation can be solved for y in terms of x, giving y equals 120 divided by x plus 2 minus 3. If we plug in that expression for y in terms of x into the expression for the area of the printed region, we get x times 120 divided by x plus 2 minus 3, and that expands out to 120x plus divided by x plus 2 minus 3x. What's the domain of this function? Well, no matter what x is, we can still construct a piece of paper which has the right dimensions uh, and the right margins. So the domain is the uh, open interval of all positive numbers. x can be anything between 0 and infinity, not including 0. So this has boiled down the entire problem into the question of finding the maximum value of this function on this interval. OK, well, to find the uh, uh, maximum value, <coughs> to find the maximum value, we cannot use the closed interval method because the domain is not a closed and bounded interval. So instead, what we'll have to do use is one of the first or second derivative tests. That means we'll definitely need to take the derivative. The derivative of p is a function of x. Using the quotient rule is x plus 2 times the derivative of 120x, which is just 120, minus 120x times the derivative of x plus 2, which is just 1. That numerator is all divided by the original denominator squared, so I have x plus 2 squared in the denominator. From that, I subtract the derivative of 3x, which is 3. So I have an expression here, which is a fraction with some factors to it. If I simplify it, it becomes 240 minus 3 times x plus 2 squared divided by x plus 2 squared. So I have multiplied out the numerator of the first fraction and simplified. And then I've gotten a common denominator with the second term here with the 3 to write it as a single fraction. The reason I wanted to write it as a single fraction is that that's the only way we can find where the fraction is going to be 0 by writing as a single fraction and looking at where the numerator is 0. The numerator is 0 when x plus 2 squared is 240 divided by 3, or x plus 2 squared is 80. And so that is true when x is 4 square root of 5, that's the square root of 80, minus 2. OK. Now what should we do here for the choice between the first derivative test and the second derivative test? Well, the way that I have written the first derivative here, it looks rather complicated to take the second derivative. On the other hand, I can break this up and write it as 240 divided by x plus 2 squared minus 3 times x plus 2 squared divided by x plus 2 squared. And that is uh, a simple fraction minus a constant. So in this case as well, it's a little bit easier to take the second derivative. What I get is negative 480 divided by x plus 2 cubed. And that has a negative numerator and a positive denominator. x is positive, so this cube thing is positive. And so this second derivative will be always negative. Uh, we have one critical point. The second derivative is always negative. Therefore, that critical point is the unique absolute maximum of the function p. So we found the maximum point. x is 4 times the square root of 5 minus 2. We can use our equation of constraint to find the other dimension. 
turns out to be 6 times the square root of 5. And so we now have all the things we need from the problem. So as we've done our few examples, several examples, they all follow the same pattern. And as you tackle these optimization problems, remember to use the checklist that we laid out for you. Understand the problem. Develop a plan by drawing a picture, identifying the changing and not changing properties, uh, writing the, the objective function in terms of the changing things in the, in the diagram, and involving the constraints to get a relationship between the variables. Once you've done all of that, you've reduced the whole thing to a calculus problem, which hopefully you'll be able to do. If you get lost in the middle of doing one of these optimization problems, try to ask yourself, what is the objective? What is it that I was asked to do in the first place? And if you need to, go back to the problem and read the words which are telling you that it's an optimization problem and what you need to optimize. The last part is kind of the tricky thing, and that's that as you do these optimization problems, the kinds of areas that you'll have to draw from to make the relationships between the variables use a lot of geometry which you may not have used for quite a while. So you'll be asked to do things using similar triangles, uh, using right triangles and the Pythagorean theorem, or also using trigonometric functions on the triangles like sine and cosine and tangent. So it would be good to read over the examples from this section to see all the kinds of uh, algebraic, trigonometric, and precalculus skills that you'll need to actually solve the problems of the section.